Hello and welcome fellow sojourners to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we pick up where we left off last week addressing the central question of abortion, which is, what is it that we are aborting? And then examine some of the highbrow philosophical arguments that deny what it is or why it matters. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your sophisticated philosophizer today as we appropriate some culture. Hmm, quite. So the argument against abortion is a simple deductive argument. All human embryos and fetuses are innocent human beings. Intentionally killing an innocent human being is murder. Murder is wrong. Therefore, killing a human embryo or fetus is wrong. The conclusion follows logically from the premises. So the question is, are the premises correct? Now, I don't think many people are going to disagree with premise number three or number two. The real question is the first premise. Is a human embryo or fetus an innocent human being? Now, as we said last week, there is certainly a religious presupposition to being pro-life, which is that all human life has inherent value and worth. That is a purely religious notion. It is a religious notion that we have impressed upon society for thousands of years and the world is better for it. But the Bible makes no explicit claim as to when life begins. People have this bizarre notion that we only believe that life begins at conception because our religion says so. No, I believe that life begins at conception not because I've read the Bible, but because I've read a biology textbook. My religion informs me how I should treat human life. Biology informs me when human life begins, and it is a biological reality that human life begins at conception. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, it creates a unique living organism. It's alive. We know it's alive. It has all the hallmarks of life. There's growth and cellular division. If it wasn't alive, you wouldn't have to kill it. And clearly, there is a difference, and we can spot the difference, between a living embryo and a dead embryo, between a living fetus and a dead fetus. We know what life looks like. If a single-celled organism was discovered in some puddle on Mars, every single newspaper in the country in big, bold letters would declare, Life found on Mars. And rightly so. But if a single-celled organism is life, then so is a fetus, and an embryo, and even, yes, a zygote. So unquestionably, biologically, it is a living organism. It is a unique creature. It has different DNA from the mother or father, so it's not living cells in a body. It is a distinct organism. Okay, so now we have to classify it. What kind of living organism is it? Now, some very, very foolish people will say things like, it's an embryo. No. Zygote, embryo, fetus, infant, toddler, adolescent, adult. Uh, those are terms that we use to describe the various developmental stages of, in this case, a human being. Saying an embryo isn't a human would be the equivalent of saying an infant isn't a human. It's an infant. Embryo is not a species. There's chicken embryos and salamander embryos and elephant embryos. That describes the developmental stage. It doesn't classify it. How do we classify it? Well, physiologically, it follows the morphology and gestation pattern of Homo sapiens, and it has the exact genetic makeup of Homo sapiens. So it's a living, distinct organism, which anyone who is being intellectually honest would have to classify as a Homo sapien. That's a living human being. And since no human embryo or fetus has ever murdered or committed heinous crimes or participated in a war, they are innocent living human beings. Let's go back to our simple deductive argument. All human embryos and fetuses are innocent human beings. Intentionally killing an innocent human being is murder. Murder is wrong. Therefore, killing a human embryo or fetus is wrong. Seems pretty straightforward to me, but here's some counter-arguments. Patrick Thomason provides us with this first thought experiment, which suggests that embryos aren't living human beings. Here it is. You're in a fertility clinic. Why is it important? The fire alarm goes off. You run for the exit. As soon as you run down this hallway, you hear a child screaming from behind a door. You throw open the door and find a five-year-old child crying for help. They're in one corner of the room. 
In the other corner, you spot a frozen container labeled 1,000 Viable Human Embryos. The smoke is rising. You start to choke. You know you can grab one or the other, but not both, before you succumb to smoke inhalation and die, saving no one. Do you A, save the child, or B, save the 1,000 embryos? There is no C. C means you all die. Now, most people would answer A, save the child, which frankly, given the choice, that's what I would answer to. And because of that, Thomason argues, see, a human child is worth more than a thousand embryos, or 10,000, or a million, because they are not the same, not morally, not ethically, not biologically. No one believes life begins at conception. No one believes embryos are babies or children. Now, this is a fun thought experiment, but it doesn't prove what Thomason thinks it proves. It reveals something about human psychology, but it says absolutely nothing about ontology. It tells us what we feel about embryos. It doesn't tell us what embryos are, or what they're worth, or even what the morally right choice is. And that's easy to demonstrate with our own thought experiments. Let's take the same concept out for a spin. Let's say that there's a fire, and you can only save either A, a thousand five-year-olds, or B, your kid. I'm sorry, children, but I'm saving my kid. Does that mean that the thousand other kids are not really human? Does that mean that they have no intrinsic worth or value? Does that mean that the other snot-nosed brats are substantively different ethically or morally or biologically? No. It means I have a psychological bias and a base instinct to protect my kid. It doesn't mean other kids are not fully human, and it doesn't give us license to electively kill other people's children, though we might wish we could. There's obviously a psychological bias toward five-year-olds over embryos. If we felt exactly about embryos as we did five-year-olds, we would not tolerate abortion, and this wouldn't be an issue at all. But that does not therefore mean that human embryos or fetuses aren't human beings. It doesn't mean that they have no intrinsic value or worth. It doesn't mean it's the right moral choice. And it certainly does not demonstrate that we should wantonly destroy them. Even if we're granting a sort of hierarchical degree of value, which we do in emergencies, we'll often say, women and children first, right? We're placing a premium on women and children in an emergency, but that doesn't therefore mean that men are not human beings. Or let's put it this way. If it were a thousand 80-year-olds or one five-year-old, and I had to pick, I would pick the five-year-old. Now, that is a value judgment on life in some sense, but that doesn't strip them of their humanity or their rights. Octogenarians are still fully human, and you can't off granny just because it would be more financially beneficial for you. What's more, a game of would you rather is not a guiding light of morality any more than a round of kill, buff, marry is dating advice. The real life scenario of abortion is us deliberately setting the embryos on fire. So even if they are lesser in some emergency hierarchical value structure, it's hard to make the argument that destroying them electively is the morally right thing to do. Now, a more sophisticated argument comes to us by Judith Jarvis Thompson, which is usually referred to as the violinist argument and appeared in Journal of Philosophy and Public Affairs in 1971, which goes like this. I propose then that we grant that the fetus is a person from the moment of conception. Oh, okay, you have my attention. Every person has a right to life, so the fetus has a right to life. No doubt the mother has a right to decide what shall happen in and to her body. Everyone would grant that. But surely a person's right to life is stronger and more stringent than the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body, and so outweighs it. So the fetus may not be killed, and abortion may not be performed. It sounds plausible, but now let me ask you to imagine this. You wake up in the morning, and you find yourself back-to-back -back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous unconscious violinist. He has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment, and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. The director of the hospital now tells you, look, 
We're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known, but still they did it, and the violinist now is plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it's only for nine months. By then, he will have recovered from his ailment, and you can safely be unplugged from you. Is it morally incumbent on you to accede to this situation? No doubt it would be very nice of you if you did, a great kindness, but do you have to accede to it? What if it were not nine months, but nine years, or longer still? What if the director of the hospital says, tough luck, I agree, but now you've got to stay in bed with a violinist plugged into you for the rest of your life? Because remember this, all persons have a right to life, and violinists are persons. Granted, you have a right to decide what happens in and to your body, but a person's right to life outweighs your right to decide what happens in and to your body. So you cannot ever be unplugged from him. I imagine you would regard this as outrageous, which suggests that something really is wrong with that plausible-sounding argument I mentioned a moment ago. Now, frankly, as a Christian, even as absurd as the situation is here, I kind of feel like, yeah, the morally right thing to do would be to remain hooked up to the violinist for nine months if it saved his life, because human life is precious. But it's a good argument in that it at least grants the premise that the unborn are people and doesn't try to weasel out of that. However, I see a couple of glaring problems. First off, it presupposes that we have the same level of moral obligation to strangers that we have to our own offspring. No, we very clearly don't. Scripturally, it says in Timothy, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We have a special obligation and moral calling to provide for our family. Now, as Christians, we do have moral obligations to even strangers. It's a good Christian act of charity to feed or shelter the homeless to meet their needs. Jesus says, anything you did for the least of these, you did for me. That's a huge calling. But it's still not the same calling. There are different moral and legal obligations to strangers and family members. If I don't feed a homeless person, I'm not going to get charged with neglect. If I don't shelter the homeless, I'm not going to get charged with abuse. But that's not true when it comes to my children, and rightly so. My children have a special right to my provision and care because of the nature of the relationship. There is a moral and legal distinction and obligation to strangers and our own offspring. Meeting the needs of a stranger is a great kindness and an act of charity. Meeting the needs of your children is not. See, the thought experiment doesn't work so well when the analogies are actually analogous. Furthermore, the burden of motherhood doesn't end with pregnancy. It just gets started. The baby outside the womb is a far more needy patient, requiring your body and your time and your finances. You have to feed the baby, burp the baby, clothe the baby, change the baby, soothe and comfort the baby, constantly trying to figure out why is it crying? Sorry, flashback. When it comes to personal autonomy and liberty for mothers, there's far more liberty when the baby is inside the womb than out. If autonomy rights and liberty trump the right to life, then wouldn't that also and equally apply to life outside the womb? If not, why not? You already granted the premise that the unborn are people just like infants. It's hard to justify how it's permissible to kill someone because of burden, but it's only permissible when it's less burdensome and not permissible when they're more burdensome. That don't make no common sense. If the argument is sound, then by the same rationale, you should be able to kill your infants. Lastly, the thought experiment mischaracterizes pregnancy as something that happens to you rather than the natural and fully expected consequence of a free will choice. You're kidnapped, knocked out, and you wake up attached to a violinist. That's only an accurate scenario when it comes to abortion if you're talking about rape. But according to the Guttmacher Institute, which is the organization that Planned Parenthood uses for all its statistics, less than 1% of abortions are due to rape. The vast, vast majority of abortions are totally elective. So let's apply that to the thought experiment. If your actions are at least partially responsible for the violinist being in that dire situation, then doesn't that change the moral calculus? Don't you have a greater moral responsibility to the violinist if his situation was caused by your volition or negligence? Of course it does, both legally and morally. All right, we'll stop there. As always, if you like what we're doing here, like, subscribe, rate, review, leave me a message, follow me on the major socials, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture.